Welcome to a bit of a special episode for Sailing Adrift. Yeah. Uh, we've made no secret of the fact that we aspire to be down in Mexico. And while we're waiting here in Warrington for a weather window to head south, we thought we'd get in touch with someone who's recently made that trip already mm -hmm. and kind of pick their brains. Yeah. So before we get started, we want to say thank you to Taylor and Mike from Sailing Via. They have a sailing channel. It's awesome. It's one of our favorites. You should definitely check it out. I'm sure Kelly will put the link in the description. Below. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have a whole list of questions for them from uh, everything from their passage to what they miss the most and what they enjoy and everything else. And just um, cruising as a lifestyle. Yeah. So the way we want to structure this, because I've seen a lot of videos like this where people are becoming, it's almost conversational, which can be great, but can also get bogged down really fast into minutia. Yeah. So we're going to ask them questions mm -hmm. and let them answer them and not try to do the back and forth thing because I think that there's a lot of good information that we could get out of this and I don't want to bog down the video. Yes. Sound good? Solid plan. All right. So should we get into it? Should yeah, we ask the questions? Go. Well, but first, well, let's let them introduce themselves. We're oh, like... yes. <laughs> Hi, guys. We are Taylor and Mike from Sailing Via, and we are coming to you from Mexico right now. And we are super excited to do this collaboration with Chris and Kelly of Sailing and Drifts, where we're going to talk a little bit about our journey down the coast from Seattle to the Sea of Cortez and some highs and lows and stories and yeah. personal favorites and the lessons whole thing. learned. Lessons and... learned. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Question number one, what we really, what the burning question, what we really want to know is how awesome or shitty was going down the coast of the Pacific Northwest and Northern California? Because I understand it's only crappy until about the LA area. That's a good one for you. Well, it's sort of a two-parter, I guess, because sailing from Seattle to like Los Angeles was exceptionally shitty. Yeah. <laughs> I think <clears throat> it was a little bit less shitty on like sort of the second half, uh, but the northern terrain I found to be pretty brutal. It's gross. Yeah, Washington to Point Conception wouldn't really ever want to sail that coast again. Mm -mm. Um, definitely gets better once you hit Southern California. Though. Yeah, the thing about downwind sailing is it sounds really nice in theory, and if you're on like really flat seas, it's probably actually quite nice but when you're like open ocean downwind sailing the thing they don't tell you is that your boat just does this the whole time the whole time yeah so that's what we were experiencing along with like 45 degree weather really intense fog and dampness and cold and seasickness and it just like i don't know man it was not it wasn't super fun i mean it was a Super cool experience from like San Diego um, sailing down to Cabo. We actually had a lot more wind than you normally see on that leg, um, and it felt a little bit more like the northern uh, Pacific as well, but definitely better on that stretch for sure. Better, yeah. yeah. And once you get about halfway down Baja, things warm up and. Yeah, that, that makes a big difference. That oh helps. my god. Yeah. Oh, lovely. I'll tell you what, I'm already prone to seasickness, so yeah. I am not looking forward to that. I'm gonna have to find a way to power through because Kelly can't get us all the way down there. No, I can't do it. <laughs> we'll just have to stick it out, man. Oh. We got some pills and some patches for it. Yeah, we got all the things. We got bracelets, pills, patches, ginger, ginger. candy. Yeah, candy. <laughs> <laughs> and the bonus, mm -hmm. if we hurl our guts out for several days on end, We'll get smelt. Yeah, we'll just be like. <laughs> we got to get ready for our beach our bodies. Our beach bodies. The old. Uh, when we're in Mexico. Barring all the seasickness and all that fun stuff, was there anything that was particularly like wild and crazy or super nerve wracking and while you were going down? Was there anything that you could have done to prepare for that? Uh, I think. Well, going around Mendocino, we had. This went from calm to like all of a sudden almost like just shy of gale force winds. Um, not for very long, so not, not long enough that the waves built really big, but it got pretty intense there for like two hours. Yeah. And was that when we had the jib sheets wrap up? Yeah, this was like the middle of the night and the waves, I don't know if they built because it was the middle of the night, but all I remember is just the hissing sound of the ocean and the waves just, I mean, we were totally surrounded. It was so loud. Um, and the wind picked up really, really strong and it was, there was no moon or it was foggy or something. I mean, it was just like total inky darkness. 
and I don't know if we were like jibing or something, but uh, our jib sheets way up on the bow had created an enormous knot, and so Mike had to go yeah. forward. I think we were wrapping in our Genoa. Yeah. We were, then we had just ended up flying the uh, like a double reef main and staysail. <clears throat> but as we were wrapping in the Genoa, the sheets just kind of we didn't do a good job of keeping them taut, and they just sort of wound up in, in the each wind. Other. Yeah. And so Mike had to go forward to untangle them way up on the bow, which stressed me out because these waves and the boat is moving and there's high wind. So Mike's all strapped in and he went up and he got it undone. But while he's up on the bow, our chart plotter, start, our radar started making a beeping sound that said that there was something detected on radar. I think it was sort of a false alarm. I think it was way off in the distance. It wasn't something that was an immediate danger, yeah. but like just, it was such a heightened thing. Like it was already so loud and scary to begin with. And then Mike was all the way up on the bow and I'm like, please just don't fall in the water in the middle of the night in this sea state. And then we've got like a beeping going on in the cockpit and it just was like <laughs> yeah. scary. I was supposed to be coming off watch and then the wind just like turned on and so I ended up staying on for another two hours or something. So just like that's how it works is just things cascade. Um, I don't know that we could have prepared for it much better. I mean we did learn to keep those jib sheets real taut especially yeah. in high winds because they will become a problem but yeah I don't know it wasn't too bad. We made it. All in all. <laughs> we made it. Yeah, Cape Mendocino is definitely one of the hairier spots along the way. And uh, I guess we'll figure out where it comes from. One, one bonus, though, that I will say is the fact that we're going down in the spring, uh, it kind of negates the treacherousness that Cape Mendocino gets because of the, like, uh, northerlies. Mm -hmm. The wind's just powering down that coast. When they hit Cape Mendocino, they, like, accelerate. But in the springtime, you get more swirly weather. So if that's the case, Cape Mendocino is less of a factor. But, you know, getting back to the seasickness thing, I know I'm prone to seasickness. Kelly does pretty good. But, like, were both of you knocked out? Like, who got seasick the most? Hey. You and Penny. <laughs> yeah, you and Penny. <laughs> you don't really get seasick at all. I don't really get seasick. I just couldn't sleep. Um, mm -hmm. That was my big thing. Was And we did uh, Crescent City, California to L.A. was, like, five Six and a half days, days yeah. and I almost didn't sleep the whole way. I think I slept the kind of the last day. So I was just exhausted. He didn't sleep. I didn't eat for that week. Yeah. It was like, <laughs> we were in rough shape. <laughs> yeah. So you guys are coming into LA. Uh, one of you is sick. The other one isn't sleeping. And you're probably questioning your life choices at this point, but you're I still at it. Yeah. You're, yeah. Still at it. you're still at it. You're still out there cruising. So at what point did the Ah, this is all worth it moment hit. Yeah. Like what, when did you decide that you're glad you did what you did? I'm not gonna lie. For me, it didn't come until we drop, dropped anchor in Cabo San Lucas, but then it was immediate and just overwhelming. Yeah. I don't know, we had, once you got around conception and things warmed up, the seas flattened and then we were surrounded by like a mega pod of dolphins. They were playing off our bow. I mean, as far, like almost like to the horizon, just dolphins it was crazy thousands and thousands of dolphins that was pretty cool yeah. um i think pulling into catalina for me like because we spent a month in la like at the docks um but then once we got out to catalina it was kind of like cruising again yeah that, that was, was pretty, pretty nice cool too. and then yeah getting into cabo but that was like the ultimate it was like oh we made it like we re and we pulled in on my birthday too so it was just like yeah. this really satisfying experience and the water was so clear and warm it was just it was awesome so you're out cruising and you've spent a lot of time in the sea of cortez and do you ever get bored do you have like an insane amount of downtime yeah that's like an irrational fear of mine yeah i don't think you would but like like it just seems like is there monotony so no to boredom definitely i i mean i can't say that i ever struggled with boredom yeah you've never been bored ever but in your life it's not something i really generally experience but um i think on that for me i think i'm less i was more bored like land life working full time mm -hmm. um i had more periods of boredom the only time i can say that i've had any inkling of boredom since we've been cruising was when you flew home kind of got stuck at home for a few weeks and i was just like on a mooring ball in puerto escondido <laughs> yeah. just kind of twiddling my thumbs for a little bit and but but it's yeah. amazing, you know, we actually, like, as far as free time, you know, I don't, well, first of all, I'm still working, so that definitely eats into free time, so it's not like we're just on vacation, but um, it is nice that I get to, you know, I own my own business, so I get to 
decide when and when I work with clients and when I don't. So I, I get to create my own schedule. So that's really nice. But um, I don't know. Like, it's amazing how much the free time just ends up getting, you know, filled with very... I mean, everything just takes so much longer with yeah. boat life too, right? Like, you can't just run to the store and do errands or just like throw a load of laundry in. Like, you know, provisioning and laundry like is most of a day, right? Yeah. So it's like, things just take a little bit longer. So you don't really like... You're never really like, hmm, what should I do today? <laughs> yeah, and usually like if we end up going to the beach or going for a hike or something or going snorkeling, we could be doing others, but there's like boat projects to do. There's always something else to do. So you still, just like a normal life, you kind of have to decide what are you going to prioritize that yeah. day. So no, you, your days fill up. Days definitely sure. fill up. Good. I'm not really in, naturally inclined to be bored ever, no. but I can tell you I go on some crazy down the rabbit hole weird projects that's if i've got time true. on my hands and that's what i'm really worried about not the fact that i'll be bored that i'll end up building myself like recreating gilligan's island completely like coconut phone and stuff if yeah. i've got too much time i'm also worried about that yeah i bet you are i, am. I believe it <laughs> next question i have is like how did the boat do like uh drifter seems pretty well set up but I'm afraid that there will be, once I make it to Mexico, projects I wish I would have upgraded, mm -hmm. gear I would have brought and brought down with me, bought and brought down with me. Yeah. You know, just general work I could have done easier in the United States before I made it to Mexico. Was there anything like that for you guys? I would, I think one of the things we learned is how, like especially coming down the coast, was how important keeping boat speed up is to shorten passages, especially when you're shorthanded, especially when seasick. half the crew is seasick, <laughs> the other half can't sleep. Um, yeah. Like every every few hours, you can cut off your passage. Really, is valuable. Um, plus, down here, just like in the Pacific Northwest, the wind is often very light. It's often blowing from the wrong direction. Yeah. So, anything to kind of increase boat speed. So for us, that'd be sails. Yeah. We have pretty old sails. Uh, we just picked up a light wind sail, like a nylon sail. That maybe would have you know prioritized that more. Maybe like a feathering propeller. Things like that. I remember when we left uh, San Diego with the Baja ha, ha and we were like, you know, it was beautiful ceiling. It was actually like champagne ceiling. It was lovely. We were out yeah. there. We were doing like, what, like five knots or something. We were just like enjoying it. It was so nice. And then uh, Kaleva, this, this, this like custom built catamaran passed us going 12 knots. 12 <laughs> knots. And they. <laughs> In 15 knots of wind. <laughs> and we were like, oh, damn. Uh, yeah. And we we're like, that must be nice. And so. I mean, we were like the last people to drop anchor in Cabo from the ha. Uh, I mean, we just have. A, we were at the back of the pack. We have yeah. a very slow boat, so I would I would agree with that. Anything to just kind of like, for safety and comfort reasons, just like. Yeah. Go like get your boat to move. Uh, Adding a half knot of speed is a big deal. Yeah. So if you can do that, I think it's it's worth it's you know the investment. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, dude. Yeah, remember that morning? Yeah, I do remember that yeah. morning. This is vindicating for me because it was like a Sunday morning. It was like 6.30 a.m. Yeah, Kelly was asleep. Early. And then I woke her up playing on my phone. She's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I just got us a, a, a drifter sail. Like, and she's great. like, what? Why? You bought a sail? <laughs> yeah, it, it was. it's a sweet old not not bad deal i think we only paid 250 bucks for this thing we've never used it no we've never used it but it is basically it a downwind yeah. sail called a drifter mm -hmm. so how could we not have one of those yeah i guess would it be ridiculous if we didn't have a drifter <laughs> it's in the name anyway we've never used the thing yeah but we will use the sail and it's red and it's cool and it wasn't that expensive and you have to have it it'll make our passages okay. faster by being in our locker yeah taking up valuable stowage area yeah, yeah. Well. do you guys have enough stowage on your boat or you feel like you're cramming stuff into weird spots closet space for you foods i mean i'm not good on closet it's just like space in general like it, it that was like our main concern with purchase not the main the, but like one of the concerns with purchasing this boat was like it was actually a little bit smaller than some of the other boats that we had been looking at and a little bit tighter on storage space and for the most part we've totally made do but like we just did like a huge provision and we just came back down for after hurricane season with like a carload of shit and i mean i'm like throwing bags of coffee in our closets and like i mean yeah. we're just like we are at capacity you right find now every nook and cranny like, I, totally full i would love like a sail locker um a little yeah. more tool storage 
things like that. Some of those big bulky items that, you know, on a boat that's 40 feet or smaller, you're just not going to have like separate storage for that. So yeah. like, like many boats, our quarter berth is just packed full of stuff. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I think a lot of people on bigger boats just have more stuff and they fill it up anyway. I mean, it's sort of like a house, right? Like you end up just like filling the space that you have. And uh, we've yeah. definitely done that. We've done that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What about like uh, availability and cost in Mexico? What down there has been like super expensive or unavailable and you'd wish that you'd have brought with you? Maybe some things that you uh, like in retrospect would recommend that we bring with us at this point is stuff like that. No, I think just um, it is very hard to get some things in Mexico. If it's not produced in Mexico, Surprising. you're going to struggle to get it. Yeah. So. Um, Importing anything is not only difficult, but uh, expensive. So spare parts, because mm. if you need it, it it's either going to cost you an arm and a leg or you're just not going to get it. So what things from land life do you feel like you miss the most? That's a good question. You go first. Miss most? I mean, I think the endless water. <laughs> uh, endless water and power probably the biggest thing yeah that's a pretty sweet luxury that I don't think anybody recognizes as a luxury but it totally is yeah but I don't miss that much honestly I mean people yeah but yeah I don't know uh, from land life I think I miss two things the most I miss baths like taking baths which is related to your answer of endless yeah. water probably and I miss fire, like fireplace. Like we had a nice little fireplace yeah. in our little house. And I just, those are two things that I just, I do miss a lot. And specifically to the Pacific Northwest, I miss the food a lot, namely Asian food uh, of all varieties. So like Japanese, Thai, Indian, like Vietnamese, like all just, there's such a good, food culture there and I love that type of food yeah. so much and that is just not something unfortunately you can get in Mexico. You can get really good Mexican food here. Yeah. Go figure. And there's yeah. a lot of Italian food. Is there? Yeah I mean we don't really do it that much but you see it. Yeah I guess Italian that's restaurants true. A lot. Yeah. yeah. I miss our kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that's kind of it though you know. Yeah. People's the big one. Yeah. Friends and family. I really like baths so did I mention that? <laughs> I, I miss baths. But we have the ocean now, so I get to go swimming. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah, that is a good one. Because since we left our marina, um, having a hot shower is few and far between. In and the last couple of weeks. In the last couple of weeks. Especially when you're at anchor. Exactly. So, what about dropping crap in the water? Like, I have dropped a ridiculous amount of stuff mm -hmm. into the river. Like, so much so I had a list on a whiteboard, and it got too long. Yeah. We ran out of space. Like, you guys ever had anything go into the blue? Our drone. That was me. Yep. We weren't even under sail, guys. We were on anchor. <laughs> Perfectly still, calm conditions, and yeah, crashed our drone. That was, yeah. That was a sad, sad day. That was yeah. an expensive one. Yeah. Yeah. We've been pretty lucky. We have netting around the boat for the dogs, and that has saved a, a surprising lot amount of, of things. <laughs> yeah. A lot of tools, and yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, we've lost sunglasses and stuff like that, but yeah, yeah. the drone was the drone. a sad day. So now we're total weenies about flying the drone. We're like so conservative about it. We have yet to fly it. Like, I think we flew it once. I don't even think we were under sail. We were like under motor. We're very nervous about it. Yeah. Well, now we have a really good drone that we do not fly from the boat. And we have, we got like a used kind of less expensive drone and that's our throwaway drone. That's like our like, <laughs> like worst get, you know, riskier flying conditions drone situation. Yeah. We bought a drone. It's a nice one. And there's a it reason floats. why we haven't used it yet. It, I'm afraid. I'm afraid to touch the stupid thing. It's yeah. been in the case since we got it, but we'll use it eventually. Anyway, Taylor, I've never seen you wear the same swimsuit twice. How many swimsuits did you guys bring down with you? I own like 40 and Mike owns like three, so. I have four now. He has yeah. four. He has yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> See, I need to go shopping. Who does? Me. I don't. No. I already have five. Yeah. <laughs> I have five swimsuits <laughs> from my balls. Yeah, they barely cover your balls. <laughs> Some of them. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> so here's a big question. Is docking the boat really a test of your marriage like it is for us? It isn't that bad. Sometimes it's bad. Not from my perspective. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's okay, so I wouldn't call it stress like it's not tense like between us. It's just tense like for us. Like it's t I think. Yeah. Maybe a little bit more tense for me than it is for him. Mike has just been like a he's an expert docker. He's really good at it. Although there was one time where we had spent like three days at sea we had left the salish sea and we were pulling into our first port of call which was newport oregon and that shit was crazy <laughs> yeah and we like we crossed the sandbar we made it across all the sort of like you know historically you know scary challenging parts of pulling into newport oregon but uh, we had made a couple mistakes. So first and foremost, well, I don't know if it was a mistake. It was kind of by no, design. You, you had really felt strongly to not have lines out and fenders out because of the risk of things. I don't know, getting caught or something like in the whatever. So well, we were in. So going to Newport, Oregon, you read about a couple of things. One is it's a bar crossing, right. um, and then it you're going into a river, and there are strong both river currents and tidal currents, and you. I was really worried that like if a line went overboard, got wrapped in the propeller, now we're just at the mercy of the current and we would have been quickly, you know, ended up aground. So that's why I was, I was especially nervous about having lines and stuff out that might go overboard and we might lose power. Yeah, so between the channel entrance and the marina, I think we thought we had more time than we ended up having. So it was a very serious scramble once we like we got through the channel and we were like, oh, we did it. And the marina's right there. So it was like, fuck. So I had to like, so he's driving. And so I had to run around and get fenders and lines out, which I managed to do, but it was like, you know, we're, we're like exhausted. I'm still seasick. Like, it, you know, um, we managed to do, but then the second that you take that corner into the Newport Marina. Well, the, again, you had the current. So we had, we, had, we went, past the entrance, turned around, I had the engine at full revs to make headway against the current, and then as you turn in, now you're beam onto the current, so you have to do this like It was like the to sideways. It was a Tokyo drift is yeah, what we ended up to, doing. To actually hit the entrance. And, and then, not hit the jetty. Yeah, and then once you get in, what was really, the real problem was there were so many, it was salmon season. It so was a were, Saturday afternoon, no, it was crab season. Yeah, which, which it was some kind of fishing season, and so everybody's like drunk on their little like you know vroom, vroom, twenty foot fishing boat, fishing boats with four hundred horsepower that can just maneuver any way they want. We're coming in on a not very maneuverable sailboat in current, like side current. We come in, come into the marina, and it's a tight. It's super marina. tight. There's all it's like there's a fuel dock right there. Everyone's waiting to fuel up. There's dinghies going by. Everyone's hammered, drunk. It's it was and, uh, chaos. It was just completely. And nuts. people were oblivious to us. And so I literally that day was standing on the bow, and I was like clapping and screaming to get people's <laughs> attention. I was like, get out of the way, get out of the way, because like we can't stop between the current and the very limited maneuverability of this boat yeah. uh it was i think to date that was the most stressful moment we have ever had on this boat period yeah. like that beats uh i must said cape hatteras what mendocino. was that mendocino it actually it was yeah it was the most stressful thing coming down the coast i think by far yeah docking i mean but we did it it wasn't like we were yelling at each other it was just it was just like a yeah. Oh my God! Like it is by the skin of our teeth that we managed to tie up. There wasn't even space on the dock. Like I had to yell at some dude who was parked like a dick, taking up the hat. I'm like, we need to put this boat like here, right now. Yeah. And so <laughs> couldn't stop, couldn't reverse, couldn't turn. I mean, it was just. It was. Yeah. But we did it. It was like incredible. You did an amazing job. It comes down to knowing like when you're yelling you're not yelling at each other it's just being heard at strangers <laughs> it's yeah. more yelling so, at strangers yeah. <laughs> yell at everybody else yeah the yeah, docking is yeah. always the most stressful i still find it to be so even in like total flat calm zero knots of wind perfectly spacious marina like I, it's just i find it to be it's tough it's tough yeah. no bow thruster makes it worse Sweet, we really appreciate you guys taking the time to chat with us. Yeah, like it's really great for you guys to take time out of your schedule to talk to a couple of noobs who yeah. are eager to get down and chase you to Mexico. Yeah, yeah, I hope that that gave you a little bit of, you know, some some stuff to work with and some highs and lows and some, some stories. I don't know, this was really fun. Yeah. So thank you. Super fun. Yeah, hopefully it's helpful for anyone who's coming down the coast. Um, yeah, it's it's worth the trip.
It is. Mexico is awesome. Steve Cortez is just beautiful. So it is all worth it if you can get down here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's worth it. I know you guys are heading south. Hopefully we'll cross paths. Yes. Hopefully. But if not, you guys are the best and thank you. Thank you so much. For sure. So. Thanks guys. Bye guys. Bye. Okay, so that was super awesome of them for taking the time. It, I actually took notes. I learned <laughs> quite a bit. Yeah, me too. And uh, um, yeah, check out their channel, Sailing Via, right here on the YouTubes. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we'll catch you guys on the flippity. Tune in next week because stuff is happening. So Kelly and I have been talking and... <laughs>